All right, okay. Can we spill? Can we spill? We can spill. All right. Ready? I left a little. That was good. That was. That was really good. Welcome to SI Now. I'm Robin Ludberg here with Matt Ufford. And Matt, would you go with the TB12 method or Tom Brady's personal trainer if it could help you chug like that? No way. That's no TB12 method. That is a man from the Big Ten. That's a college skill. What we just witnessed was a man who desperately misses pounding brewskis. He didn't look like a college student there, though. He looked like the henchman for a bad guy in an action movie. <laughs> he does have <laughs> that quality where he's like the second to last guy that John Wick kills. <laughs> uh, NFL quarterbacks. <laughs> How do you transition, right? Yeah, right, right. From right. John Wick to Case Keenum, it's what we always do. No, NFL quarterbacks are leading off our headlines today. Um, and Case Keenum is the first domino to fall. He signed with the Denver Broncos. Does this make Denver a contender again? Not necessarily. I think what people are doing is confusing Denver from a couple years ago with Denver from last year. That was a 5-11 team that was more than a quarterback away. We know they didn't have great quarterback play, but they allowed 51 and 41 consecutive points at one point last season. So Case Keenum's the kind of quarterback where if you're on the highway – and you're on cruise control, he's good. You know, he's competent. He can drive the car. But if you're trying to weave in and out of traffic and beat some of the faster cars, I don't know if Case Keenum's necessarily your guy. That's fair. I, 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 I'm a Case Keenum proponent, but also you're very right. That's not the same Denver Broncos defense it once was. So we've seen those QB dominoes fall with that taking place. Alex Smith going to, to um, Washington, of course. That leaves Kirk Cousins still out there. How do you think Keenum's signing affects Kirk Cousins? I'm really surprised by the development. I thought that Cousins was going to be the first domino to fall, and that would pave the way for Keenum to then go to the Broncos because I, I thought that he would, like, again, with Cousins being kind of that number one target in the quarterback market, uh, I think Case Keenum like, really just kind of jumped. and was like, no, this is what I'm doing. Perhaps the Vikings made it clear to him that you know, he, was, he was free to go. Does it make Cousins a must for the Vikings? I think, well, I don't know about Musk because they still have two more quarterbacks on the roster that, that are free agents that they could re-sign. But I think that he's their number one target. And I think that Cousins, if he's smart, should be targeting the Vikings as well because the other suitors are the Cardinals, Browns, and Jets. And none of those three teams have the roster talent and the ability to win a Super Bowl that the Vikings do. Yeah, I think the Vikings have emerged as the clear favorite. I'd probably put the, the Jets due to desperation at number two. Some receivers are on the move as well as Allen Robinson is headed to the Bears on a three-year $42 million deal. While Sammy Watkins reportedly will get a three-year deal of his own worth $48 million to head to the Chiefs. So Robinson to the Bears or Watkins to the Chiefs. What's the bigger deal? I like Watkins to the Chiefs just because I think the Chiefs have more weapons in place with a better coach. Uh, or at least the, the Bears have an unproven one, so we don't know. Uh, I, what this is going to be is a referendum on the two teams' quarterbacks. Frankly, I've been more impressed by what I've seen from Patrick Mahomes in about two games than what I saw from Mitchell Trubisky in 16. But Bears fans are very, very adamant that Mitchell Trubisky – even after a 180-yard game where he throws a game-sealing interception, is like the fourth-best Bears quarterback ever. And also, they might not be wrong. Yeah, I like the move for Trubisky. It gives him a, a bit of a security blanket there. But the upside is higher depending on what Mahomes can do. If Mahomes is an explosive quarterback and all of a sudden you got Hunt and, you know, Tyreek, all those guys out there for him, speed. that might be the best offense in the entire NFL yeah. at that point. Plus Andy Reid's willingness to, to in, have inventive plays for him. I like it a lot. Let's move over to the NBA. With a three-game losing streak, the Spurs have fallen out of la the last playoff spot in the West. But Kawhi Leonard, his return could be imminent. Now, does this make them a dangerous play for an eight seed or are we looking at the end of an era I think it might be both here with San Antonio 18 consecutive 50 win seasons think about that for a second that's preposterous did they do that in the lockout season too yes they were 50 and 16 in a 66 game season that year so that's not regular that's not normal it's going to be very tough for them to reach 50 wins we know Duncan is gone Ginobili and Parker at the end here so that era is probably over we'll see if they can rebuild on the fly obviously Kawhi was a big reason you thought they could at the same time as they may be squeezing the, the final juice out of that that run 
Who wants to see them in the first round if Leonard's healthy? I mean, you're talking about a top five, top ten player who's scary on defense. They might as well play the, the Jaws music while he's roaming around the perimeter on defense. So if you're Houston or Golden State, you're going, hey, because while the era might be over, it's kind of like in pro wrestling when somebody's in the sleeper hold and you, you put their arm down and it goes down twice. And on the third one, it stops right short of the mat and then they, they bring it back up to the top. You don't want to see that happen with the San Antonio Spurs in the first round. <laughs> that wrestling metaphor is a very nice segue uh, because speaking of past their prime legacies, CM Punk announced his return to MMA for UFC 225. What's your takeaway? I want to see him in wrestling. Not in the UFC, not in mixed martial arts. We saw that. Didn't go so well for him. He shouldn't sully his chance at, at a pro wrestling return by being embarrassed again in the octagon. CM Punk is one of the most captivating personalities, I think, ever in the squared circle. He's actually the last guy where sometimes things will happen on Raw or one of these shows that I'll check out. But he's the last guy that made me tune in for what he might say. Obviously, there was an ego battle there with Vince McMahon and everything else, and he's on his way out. But to me, this is too much of an ego move. All right, you want to prove you can do this, fine. But that's not where your skill set is. Go do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, his first and only fight was in 2016, a first-round submission loss. Uh, I would be concerned, if I were a UFC fan, what does this say about the product when we have to roll out CM Punk in front of his hometown crowd of Chicago in order to feel like that's a draw for the fans? I'd be concerned. Well, UFC's getting up there in numbers, right? You mm -hmm. keep going, all right, what are we going to do with 226? But still in his prime is Alexander Ovechkin, who scored two goals in the Capitals' overtime win, expanding his lead-leading mark. But more importantly, he tallied his 600th career goal, making him our adrenaline performer, presented by Toyota. Let's go places. Ovechkin becomes the 20th player in NHL history with 600 goals. However, he's just the fourth player to reach that milestone within 1,000 games, joining Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, and Brett Hull. Pretty good company. At his current pace, he would pass Gretzky as the all-time leader in six more seasons of play. But can he be mentioned in the same breath without the postseason success? That's the big butt with Ovechkin, right? And yes, an all-time great player is an all-time great no matter whether they win in the playoffs or not. We have, like, Chris Paul is an NBA superstar, full stop. And yes, he hasn't had NBA playoff success yet, but he's still an all-time great just for what he's done on the court. Same thing with Ovechkin. And we can admire those numbers. And we don't. it doesn't have to be a black mark on his career. He's a great player all-time great full stop. It's amazing, though, that he could even catch Gretzky. Like, sometimes when you hear that name thrown out there, he's the one even more so than a Michael Jordan because you start saying LeBron James. You know, in, in other sports, Tom Brady, others would say Joe Montana or Lawrence Taylor. That sort of is mentioned by himself. So to mm -hmm. see someone coming for one of his marks is surprising, yeah. almost, despite all the goals that Ovechkin has scored. But if you're getting to that level, that's when the, the tie goes to the postseason success exactly. if he is in a tie with any of those other guys we mentioned, like... Lemieux, speaking of postseason success, we've begun working on our NCAA men's bracket. Well, I, I'm, I guess I'm calling postseason success for me. <laughs> now we can do the same on the women's side as the field has been revealed with, wait for it, UConn as oh, the number one overall seed. Yes. <laughs> Is the Huskies' dominance good or bad for women's college basketball? It's great. Um, and so there's, there are two kinds of fans for any sport, right? There are the diehards and there are the casual fans. And with a sport like women's basketball, you're really only going to attract the casual fans when you've got uh, a, a behemoth like, like UConn women and their success, the, the, the general public's interest is determined by how, how far their success is. And you can root against them, you can root for the underdog, but you at least want to see UConn make the Final Four, make the championship game so that the interest remains higher. It's kind of like Tiger Woods in golf. In general, I think dynasties are good for sports. They have star power, they give people a emotional feeling, right, whether they're rooting for them or against them. But you need some sort of foil. So they need someone to emerge as some sort of foil or else people just kind of throw their hands up. Of course, March Madness is a chance for many to get a closer look at some of the top prospects for the NBA. We're going even deeper in our new draft prospect series.
Now, every week you can check out the latest NBA power rankings on SI.com, but while the top is bunched up, so is the bottom, as there is a lot of competition for lottery balls and a guy like DeAndre Ayton. We thought we'd go over the other side of the bracket, I suppose, if you will, and do our power tankings. Matt, who you got? Power tankings. <laughs> uh, the team that is most interesting to me is the team that's actually at the bottom of my list, the Brooklyn Nets, because they're just wandering in a nihilist desert. Of, of teams and this is what it looks like when you both give up all your draft capital and have no good players and they're going to feel the pain this this coming first round missing out on probably a top five pick they're not going to tank for the Cavs because of a bad trade they made five years ago it is incredible to me and it's it's I think that they're an interesting fun team to watch but they are extremely bad I can't believe you had the, the Hawks at the top of your list I mean let's look over my rankings of course there's going to be some similarities when we're going through these things when you have all these teams that are bad but at, at the very top I mean if you're looking at the bottom the Mavericks are too respectable to fully tank the Kings are too dysfunctional to properly tank then you get to the Hawks who have done a remarkable job as of late you have them at number one well what's good for them is that they've held out Kent Bazemore with a bruised knee but you can't put them over the Grizzlies the Grizzlies have lost 18 consecutive games that is tanking personified and instead of playing the game of is there a random Grizzlies player you can't name you could play the game of name as many players on the Grizzlies roster as you can and some people would stall out at like two once they went past Mark Gasol and Chandler Parsons yeah uh, who, who's the uh, the guy from Florida State who scored five, uh, 30 points in five minutes uh, Rattan somebody yeah he was 0 for 5 and in, in Rattan, Rattan Mays, Mays in the, in the last uh, Grizzlies game he was 0 for 5 so he hasn't replicated it at just, the NBA just level keep sending them up uh, no but back on the Hawks they uh, the only reason I bumped them ahead of the Grizzlies the Grizzlies are the chic pick I went with the Hawks because of their horrific record in conference they have played three fewer games than the Magic but have in the, in the Eastern Conference but have somehow have three fewer wins than the Magic and it's just like when they're they're actually even though they have the same record as the Magic they are really underperforming in a in a in a lesser Eastern Conference. Well, here's a look at another NBA prospect the Hawks may be vying for. I'm here with the Hall of Famer, the Admiral, David Robinson, who comes to us courtesy of Dove Men Care. Now, David, you're doing a lot around the NCAA tournament, but I, I think people remember you more for your NBA career, obviously, but you had a run in your, the tournament in your junior year. Right. In your senior year, you put up big numbers. How would you compare your NCAA tournament experience to your NBA playoff experiences? Well, the NCAA tournament, especially for a, a, a smaller school, you know, those mid-major schools, is, is your stage it's the it's the greatest opportunity for you to show what you can do and um, and so for us it was it was fantastic my sophomore year we got a chance to play LSU and then Maryland and then junior year we made a run to the final eight which was fantastic uh, and senior year we played Michigan in the first round so that was the biggest stage we had my whole time when I was in college. What do you make yeah. of, of the latest scandal and, and really overall the controversy about all the money that goes in to March Madness and, yeah. and the, this big corporation versus uh, the athletes not getting it? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of money flying around the March Madness. I mean, that's, um, there's no question about that. And, uh, you know, we always talk about the one and dones. Uh, I'm kind of on the other side of the coin where, hey, I was a four-year guy, and the, the stage that March Madness gave for me allowed me to earn, have great earning potential, you know, and going to a great school allowed me to have great earning potential. So I think a lot of these kids that come out now, there are, there's a small handful of kids that probably could make that jump from high school to pro. Not very many. And so hopefully, you know, we can give these kids a chance to take advantage of probably what's going to be their best opportunity, get a great education. And, and so hopefully, you know, we can make some decisions. You know, being on this basketball, basketball commission for me has been a 
great experience. I've learned a lot and been around some really, really smart people. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can make some recommendations that'll help, uh, help us figure out how to give these athletes and these students the best opportunity available. And your son, uh, Justin, is at, at Duke. Now, he hasn't played too much. You don't strike me as one of those dads who's going to be yelling and screaming to put him <laughs> in the game. Have you ever called up Coach K to give him an earful? No, uh, should I? I don't, I don't know. I'm, no, no I, you know, I, I'm, I think he's having a tremendous experience. I mean, it, you know, he's, uh, he was a walk-on, and now he's actually a scholarship kid, and he's been having just a blast. It's a, it's a great group of guys. So I, I've enjoyed it, and I think my son has had a, a great time with it. Uh, and I, I've watched him grow up as a young man, so it, great experience. Now, shifting to the NBA, of course, your career, legendary with the Spurs, yeah. and some experiences with Greg Popovich. Yeah, I've heard you yeah. say he's doing one of his best jobs this yeah. year. Do you consider yeah. him the greatest coach of all time? Oh, wow. Huh. Scary. I don't, I don't really make those generalizations. I leave that for the real smart people. Um, he's amazing. He really – he's an amazing coach. And – I mean, you know, you can look at his track record and obviously over a 20, 25 year period, the program that, you know, that's a sign of a great coach. I think Pop has been a, a, a great general manager and a great coach. So um, you got to give him credit for being a part of that machine. What is it about him that, that makes him able to manage a situation like this year with Kawhi Leonard out and still have the, the team right in the mix of things? I think part of it is just focus. I mean, I, you know, I think you learn that in the military, right? You have a mission to do and you stay focused on your mission. Um, just don't get distracted. I think he's wonderful with that. You see him, um, the amazing focus he brings to every game. You know, he, he doesn't try to take any credit. It's not about him. It's, it's about what are we going to do together. Um, and he, he, he transfers that feeling to the players. And I think the players get to that point where all they care about is, are we winning? <laughs> you know, what is it going to take for us to win? And let's do that. Um, so it's, it's been very, very successful over a long period of time. Which is strange why we heard some rumors about tension between yeah. Kawhi Leonard and the Spurs this year. You don't expect to hear that. What did you make of those reports? Well, I mean, obviously there's probably a little bit of truth to some of that stuff, but big deal. I mean, you know, <laughs> every team goes through transitions. Every team is trying to figure out, hey, how, do, how is, is this guy growing into a leader? Is this guy growing into a leader? I mean, you know, it's, it's a part of the growth process. It's a part of the shifting and the changing. And Kawhi is, is a been an incredibly important part of our, our franchise. We love him. Obviously, we all want him to be around forever. But, I, you know, it, it's the reality of the situation. Hey, he's got to grow up as a leader, as a player, and all that. We, we've got young kids who haven't been to the finals. They don't know what that feels like. And, you know, the guys who have been there are going to have to lead them. So that's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Not, you know, it's a hard thing for everyone. I had to learn it. Timmy had to learn it. And now, you know, Kawhi and LaMarcus are guys that are, are going to have to learn it. And, and what is it going to take to get us to that level? They've got the Warriors and the Rockets and the Cavaliers and Celtics. They're all obstacles. How do we jump over those obstacles? Yeah, you mentioned the, the Warriors. You were a little upset. There was a, a Warriors logo behind you on the, the set earlier. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah. yeah. What's, what's going on? I, th I thought you guys would have a Spurs logo or something when there, I came in. There's always these conversations about how certain people would adapt to various eras and, you know, maybe the, yeah. the old school big man being phased out. I think with your athleticism, your ability to get up down the floor, shoot the ball, you would thrive. But how do you think head up? Uh, somebody like you would do against the Golden State Warriors and these small ball three-point shooting teams? I mean, I, I'm a, I firmly believe defense wins all the time. And, you know, defense wins championships. And we were one of the best defensive teams. And, you know, we had great size. We had great athletic mobility. I think we would have competed very, very well. I liked our team. I thought we were, you know, very tough. Definitely not as talented offensively as a Kevin Durant and the Clay Thompson and, you know, Steph Curry. That's a pretty amazing combination. Uh, but, you know, we had our strengths. You had your strengths, and you had to go against some other strengths, including Shaquille O'Neal. Did you see the um, video that SB Nation put together sort of chronicling your beef history with Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> you got to love media, man. They, you, know, you, know, I, you know, I played with them in the Olympics, and now obviously we played against each other. And, you know, yes, when you step out on the floor, you know, I don't care whether it was the Utah Jazz or the Houston Rockets and Akeem or whether it was, uh, you know, the Lakers and Shaq. You don't like those guys when you're playing against them. I mean, that's the bottom line. But, I mean, but it's all just competition. We're all competitors. We're all kind of alpha dogs. And, uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be – it's going to be a challenge. What I found interesting about it, though, is he had this story that you snubbed him for an autograph yeah, when he was young. He'll tell you to this day he was lying Yeah, he that. said he was, he was lying. How strange is that to make up that story? Well, you know Shaq. You know Shaq. I mean, he's a, he's a showman. He likes to make – you know, and he's really good at it. He's entertaining. That's what people love about him, right? And so – 
he was making it entertaining. And for me, you know, I, I'm not a big, you know, trash talker, so I don't, I didn't really get into the back and forth, but it's fun. Everybody does a little something. If you talk to Michael Jordan, you know, he'll tell you, you know, he had to do things to motivate himself day in and day out to say, hey, look, I got slighted. I'm going to go and, uh, you know, take advantage of this person. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of Shaq and part of him making the game interesting and fun and, you know, it, it made us have some great battles, which I love. Did you ever talk to him about that afterwards? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when we were on the team, we were on the Olympic team in 96 together, and we had some great talks about it and, and some great laughs. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, when you're playing against each other, though, it, it, whatever you need to motivate yourself, you need to do it because it, it, the, the competition is going to be intense and the scrutiny is going to be intense uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, and so, yeah, I... <laughs> We just laughed about it later. Well, you guys had some great games against one another. Now, yeah. tell us a, a little bit about what you're doing with uh, Dove uh, Plus Men Care. Well, you know, I think, you know, Dove has done a great job trying to say, hey, look, let's celebrate the fans. Let's show the fans what role they've played in the athlete's life. And, you know, for me, obviously, whether it's in the NCAA tournament where that was my stage, that was my opportunity coming out, um, it, it – the fans played a huge role there. And then I go to the NBA and I see these families who are committed to the team and they're coming every day. And so, so Dove just wants to celebrate the fan. You know, they want to celebrate, you know, what the fan means to the players. And so, um, you know, you take a great product like the men's Dove Men's Plus Care. And then here we are. Let's show the fans what the caring means to us. The Admiral David Robinson, appreciate your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. We now welcome in Connor Orr of the MMQB, who comes to us courtesy of Toyota Let's Go Places. Connor's here to go over how some of the latest NFL news could impact the NFL draft and how some of the running backs could be selected after Saquon Barkley. But first, Connor, Keenum to the Broncos. How do you think this will affect the QBs in the draft? Well, I think it'll be interesting specifically from Denver's perspective, right? Everyone's wondering if they're going to be players at number five. I personally thought Quentin Nelson from Notre Dame was going to be a good fit there, but John Elway said at the Combine he wants to keep taking swings at these rookie quarterbacks, so maybe is Paxton Lynch on the trade block? Is he going to try to clear the decks and create a similar scenario that the Bears had last year with Mike Glennon and Mitchell Trubisky? But, you know, I think this is just uh, it's a fascinating year for quarterbacks. We could see four go in the top six, and, uh, you know, if Denver remains a player here, that's, that's going to get really interesting. Yeah, Connor, the, uh, John Elway just got to keep on swinging. Uh, the Bills moved up to the 12th spot in the draft in a trade with the Bengals. With Tyrod Taylor now gone, could they be looking at a quarterback, or is it you know, time to let Nathan Peterman cook? Yeah, no, I think there's no doubt that they're trying to pull, a, you know, kind of a similar move that the Eagles did where they're going to swap picks just to try to get themselves closer, get a little bit of ammo. That Colts pick at number three is a really interesting trade spot. I think they could get in there and get the quarterback they want. If you look at what they're doing in free agency, just signed another big uh, defensive tackle to a large money deal. They don't have really the cap space for another free agent quarterback to come in here. So it's going to be Nathan Peterman and uh, a first round pick, I think, to compete for that job this year. The draft feels like quarterbacks and Saquon Barkley, but after Barkley, who is the next running back that's coveted by teams in this draft? I think Darius Geis from LSU. Um, you know, if, you, if you're already getting a Marshawn Lynch comparison at this point in the draft, I think that teams are, are genuinely going to fall in love with you. Uh, he helps negate some of the offensive line play up front, uh, just that physical, tough running style. Um, you know, if you, especially if you have a young rookie quarterback, this is a guy like Leonard Fournette in Jacksonville who can grind out those extra yards and uh, really help move your offense along. Yeah, last year, the Chiefs snagged Kareem Hunt out of Toledo in the third round. Who do you think is kind of an overlooked back, maybe small school or maybe for other reasons, uh, that could be this year's version of Hunt? Well, I think there's a couple choices. I mean, you know, you have Rashad Penny from San Diego State, uh, you know, uh, yards leader last year. I think it was... Uh, you know, over 2,000 rushing yards, super productive, more than 20 touchdowns. So, um, you know, a great year for him. He's got the right size, too, kind of in that 220, 225 pound range, your ideal fit for sort of a first and second down back. And, and Sony Michelle from Georgia, I mean, a guy that I think if he puts a little bit of weight on, um, can be definitely a dominant force in the NFL. I think almost eight yards per carry for the Bulldogs this year. So there are some guys that are going to be in that second to third to fourth round um, where, you know, you're going to get almost as much value. Obviously, Saquon Barkley is in another league, but you're going to get some great value. You're going to get that Kareem Hunt-type production out of a mid-round guy. 
Connor Orr, we appreciate your insight. We'll check in with you as we get closer to the NFL draft. Thanks. Meanwhile, another quarterback is off the market. Drew Brees, two-year, $50 million deal with the Saints. I don't think anybody thought he was going anywhere, but well, it's official. Yeah, nice money if you can get it. Um, yeah, it's not a surprise. Uh, I'm a little disappointed just because I was hoping for some big shakeup, Brees to the Vikings, but it's, it's the right move for the Saints, and uh, they've, they've just ignored any sort of salary cap issues for years now. And it keeps working for him. Yeah, the, the chaos would have been fun, but it, it seemed like a, a fait accompli that Drew Brees would wind up re-signing with New Orleans considering yeah. his career there. That does it for SI Now today. We'll be back tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, you can check out all the latest videos and updates via SI Now Live on Twitter.